Hello, uh, my name is Stefan Seele. I'm the CEO of Coliago Consulting. Uh, uh, Coliago Consulting is a specialist telecoms management consulting firm, and about 80% of our work is spectrum related. And I'm going to talk to you uh, today about the six gigahertz spectrum and uh, the value it might bring if it were to be used for IMT and in particular 5G. So I prepared uh, some slides for you. Let me share them with you. Here they are. I hope you can all see them. Um, so, first of all, if you would like to receive uh, a report on which these slides are based, please do send me an email uh, to the address uh, shown here that's uh, free of charge. Um, what I'm going to cover today is to look at the need for IMT spectrum to realize the 5G vision, uh, modeling demand for area traffic capacity, and then modeling traffic cap area traffic capacity itself, i.e. supply and demand, and then comparing the demand for area traffic density and supply in five cities, and look it, at the role of six gigahertz spectrum outside the cities, uh, and then also compare unlicensed and licensed use in the six gigahertz band, i.e. Uh, IMT mobile versus Wi-Fi, address sharing with incumbents and then summarize the key findings. So first of all, 5G and spectrum. Of course, we all agree that 5G will bring huge socioeconomic benefits, but in order to do that, more spectrum is required. And we are just at the starting point of 5G. So what we are looking at is the period to 2030, uh, a point at which 5G is likely to be mature in most markets around the world. So specifically, we examine the six gigahertz midband spectrum from 5925 to 7125 megahertz as a candidate band for 5G. When we talk about 5G, the starting point really must be the definition of 5G or what are the requirements. And 5G has been the started really uh, in the context of the ITU, all countries have signed up to it. And the key things that drive the need for spectrum are the requirement for a user experience data rate of 100 megabits, which is 10 times more than what it is now, and an area traffic, capa traffic capacity, which is a hundredfold greater than uh, what is possible now. And in that sense, why is that so? Well, 5G isn't just a, a simple evolution of 4G. It is a revolution. Uh, I represent this here by LDE. Essentially, what we're looking at is uh, smartphone users. And then there's a little bit of traffic coming from uh, M2M uh, or, or narrowband uh, uh, IoT applications and so on. But 5G is, of course, much more than that. It is, of course, still uh, used by smartphone users, but it's all the other stuff. So in addition to enhanced mobile broadband, we have massive machine type communication, critical machine type communication, and importantly, fixed wireless access, which is, in fact, the first 5G uh, business case in the uh, US. So the spectrum that is uh, used and needed uh, for 5G includes both legacy bands, i.e. in which today uh, 2G, 3G, and 4G is run, which will transition to 5G, and then new spectrum in the upper mid band, uh, 3.5 uh, and hopefully 6 gigahertz. That mid band spectrum is uh, required to deliver the user experience data rate of 100 megabits uh, in cities. And then we have the high bands or millimeter wave uh, which is required to uh, deliver that target of the 10 megabit per square meter area traffic capacity. Um, a range of spectrum assets is required for operators. We have the sub one gigahertz band as a coverage layer. Then we have the lower mid band, which provide uh, also coverage, but perhaps not in the extreme rural areas. And in the cities, uh, 
urban and suburban, we have the upper midbands, uh, 3.5, 4 gigahertz, and 6 gigahertz for citywide speed coverage, i.e. the user experience data rate of 100 megabits. And then, of course, we have the millimeter wave, which is not does not provide contiguous coverage, but is deployed in hotspots where needed. So uh, the need for spectrum is driven by traffic density. So let's look at the uh, ITU requirements in that context. The data volume uh, driven approach to modeling future spectrum need was quite useful in a, in a 4G world. People looked at how much uh, traffic per user per month on a smartphone, perhaps a little bit of uh, IoT traffic and so on. And assumption is piled on assumption and, and out comes a, a spectrum forecast. But the ITU 2020 requirement is really different because it doesn't focus on data volume, it focused on the experienced data rate. And there are important differences uh, because what then matters is you have to deliver that data rate most of the time because there's an expectation that that users will really experience this most of the time. And indeed, uh, recently I saw the news wire that more and more regulators are moving towards saying that there needs to be a, a quasi-guarantee or sort of 90% value for experiencing that. And that method of simply using the user experience data rate as a starting point for the modeling uh, gives you a, a concise and easily verifiable model. So uh, the, with 5G, a key factor in driving the demand for capacity is the vision of the 100 megabits uh, to data rate anytime, anywhere, whilst on the move. So mobility is part of that. Uh, and of course, we all know that uh, fundamentally a shared network such as a radio network, you can never guarantee a speed, but at least the probability of experiencing that data bit would be very high. So networks then will be designed to deliver a data rate, i.e. megabits, rather than data volume, uh, i.e. gigabytes per month. And in that context, perhaps something very useful to bear in mind, uh, it is far more expensive to produce a fast gigabyte than it is to produce a slow gigabyte. So we're looking really at speed rather than traffic volume. Uh, next, let's look how we actually model the demand for area traffic capacity in cities. Uh, this is our uh, model. We start with the ITU requirement of user experience data rate. We then use population density as a proxy uh, for traffic demand. We assign an activity factor, that is how many people or applications uh, demand uh, uh, spectrum or bandwidth simultaneously. And then we also take account that some of the traffic will be offloaded at hotspots to millimeter wave uh, sites. Uh, and on the supply side, so that gives us the traffic demand per uh, square kilometer in terms of gigabits per uh, uh, square meter. And we then look at the uh, supply side, which is really how many sites do I have, i.e. the intersite distance sites per uh, uh, across a particular city. We have the sectorization of the site. We have the amount of spectrum deployed on the site and we have the spectral efficiency. That gives us the capacity supply per square kilometer. We measure it in gigabits per square meter. Um, we use population density as a proxy for area traffic demand. Uh, this is uh, conservative because there are, of course, uses which have nothing to do with traditional smartphone usage. Uh, but uh, for, for example, uh, using cars, cameras, or other things, uh, we could assume that the other usage is also happens in the area where people are. Clearly, it doesn't make much sense to have sensors and cameras in, in places where people are not. So the density of cameras is very much linked to the density of people. Uh, same goes for sensors and so on. Uh, population density, we look at that over a reasonably large area, typically a city or at least 
part of a city where density is sufficiently high. So uh, this is an example from, uh, an, from Tokyo, so in Asia Pacific. Uh, we have chosen a contour of uh, an area that is 17 point, so 17,500 people per square kilometer. Uh, we are not really considering the administrative uh, Tokyo, we are considering uh, where population density occurs. And we picked the central region, which is an area of 173 uh, square kilometers, the population density just under 20,000 people per square kilometer, uh, so uh, a population of 3.3 million in that area. We did that also for Lagos, and as you can see, the areas are not always contiguous, so there might be parts of a rather large urban area. Uh, here we can see the uh, population in that particular area is very much bigger. Uh, Sao Paulo is another example, uh, but uh, the population density sort of vary between uh, upwards of 16 to 2100. Paris is an example of a relatively small area inside the per peripherique, only uh, 85 square kilometers, but a very high density of 25,000 people per square kilometers. And we also included Russia. And all of that, by the way, it's in the report, uh, which uh, when you send me an email, you'll be able to receive. So next, we have to look at the activity factor. What is that? That is concurrent demand. So how many people or how many applications are demanding bandwidths in the same cell? So today, the activity factor might be somewhere in the region of 5% or so. And networks are not designed for everybody to do everything at the same time. They're designed uh, with bearing in mind not everybody uh, will be watching a video in the same cell at the same time. Uh, but in addition, in future to human traffic, we will, of course, have also high bandwidth traffic from IoT application. Concurrent use or the activity factor is increasing. Why? Because smartphone usage is increasing. Uh, the average usage per smartphone was seven gigabytes per month in 2019. In Finland, it's already five times higher. And looking at 5G in Korea, it's even higher. And this is driven by the fact that most data plans for 5G are unlimited. So increased usage means people are using uh, more often data for longer periods, and that in, in increases the activity or concurrent use factor. And so I, we would expect concurrent use to be heading uh, towards the sort of 15, 20% mark or so. Uh, we then ask ourselves, okay, fine, there will be some hotspots which will carry traffic over millimeter wave sites, but however, these hotspots won't cover much of an area Nevertheless, we have assumed that 20% of the traffic will be offloaded to millimeter wave. The rest needs to be carried by uh, the remaining spectrum and mostly uh, the upper and lower, sorry, yeah, the upper and lower mid-band spectrum. So let's look at the other side, which is the, we lo now looked at demand. So let's look at capacity. So we have our uh, macro and micro sites, sectorization, uh, the, how much spectrum is uh, deployed, and the spectral efficiency, which gives us the capacity supply per square kilometers. And here are assumptions for the various bands and the average uh, intersite distance. Now, that might vary a little bit from city to city, but these are typical value aligned with the real world. So for example, we have assumed three sectors for macro sites, but only one sector for uh, small cells. And you can see here the downlink spectral efficiency varies. Uh, we have, of course, uh, we're looking forward to when all of this is 5G and massive MIMO will be deployed if, if possible. And so that uh, increases spectral efficiency we have typically 190 megahertz available in low bands, 460 in the lower mid bands, and depending on the country, 200 to 800 megahertz in 3.5, 4.5. And now, and this brings me to the real topic, six gigahertz, 
we run various scenarios whether there is any available at all only 700 megahertz or 1.2 gigahertz uh, so those are the various scenarios so we then compared demand for area traffic cap uh, traffic density and supply of area traffic capacity in those five cities which i flicked through earlier so to illustrate the output, we did that in Lagos, Moscow, Paris, Sao Paulo, and Tokyo. And as I said, we look to the 2030 timeframe. You might say that's a long time, but after all, when we're looking uh, at all of this in the contracts over the spectrum, should have an INT identification. Uh, so the next WRC is in, in 23, uh, then if that is all agreed, then the licensing process has to start uh, and it has to be deployed. So I think 2013 is, is uh, 2030 is a sort of appropriate time frame uh, to look at this. And this is really the thing in spectrum management. You have to look ahead a long way, and 10 years is probably an appropriate time frame to see whether the capacity supply uh, can actually put in place to meet the traffic demand per square kilometer. So uh, these are just a summary of the population density in the cities. Uh, you can look at this in a little bit more uh, detail later when you look at the slides. But as you can see, the population density in the relevant areas varies from about a low 19,000 per square kilometer to a very high 28,000 in, in Lagos. And that in itself means that the differences in the need for spectrum because if we postulate that demand is proportion, proportionate to uh, population density, then this is a key driver. Um, why uh, do we look at the uh, uh, six gigahertz spectrum in particular? Well, WRC 23 offers an excellent opportunity for the global or regional harmonization of that band. The various portions of the band has, have been deployed. There's the uh, 6425 to 7025 uh, relevant for ITU region one and globally another 100 megahertz. And then uh, of course, outside the whole process, depending on the region or country, uh, the entire 1.2 gigahertz uh, might be uh, assigned. So uh, the scenarios uh, are further affected by the ability of upper mid-band spectrum in the C-band 3.3 to 4.2 and also 4.4 to uh, 4.9. In Lagos, uh, maybe 400 megahertz available. Moscow, only 200. There is no C-band spectrum available. Paris, probably 600 in time in the C-band. Sao Paulo, again, similar issue, only 200 in the C-band. Tokyo, uh, well, I must say this, our Japanese friends, they're really very good spectrum managers, 800 megahertz available, 700 in the C-band, and 100 at 4.5. So you can see uh, Tokyo, the position is relatively good, but let's see whether they actually still need spectrum in six gigahertz. So this chart here is perhaps at first glance uh, a little bit complicated, let me uh, explain the chart. So we have on the horizontal axis, the population density, and you can see the marker for Tokyo. The population density, as we saw previously in the central area, the uh, just above 19,000. So that's the horizontal purple dashed line. And then on the vertical axis or the Y axis, we have the capacity or and traffic in terms of gigabits per square uh, kilometer. And the horizontal dashed lines, those are the capacity line depending on the scenario. So the lowest line, the lowest black dashed line is where we have no six gigahertz spectrum. The next one is where we have got that 700 megahertz with this is 600 plus 100 globally. And then the, the uh, uh, top, uh, horizontal line, that's the one where the entire 1.2 gigahertz uh, would be used for 5G IMT. And then the colored line that are sloping upwards, these are the demand line. We have traffic demand with an activity factor of 5%, 10%, and so on. 
And you can see if the activity factor reaches 15%, even in Tokyo, which has uh, a lot of spectrum in the uh, mid-band, even then uh, Tokyo would be running out of spectrum and at least some uh, six gigahertz spectrum is required. Of course, if we assume that current de concurrent demand is higher, the activity de factors are higher, uh, you can see that the colored lines with higher activity factors cross the uh, horizontal lines at various points and certainly uh, the 700 megahertz uh, of six gigahertz spectrum is required or, or is recommended by 2030 for Tokyo. Uh, Nigeria, higher population density. So you can see where you look where this colored line uh, across the population density, they tend to be well above uh, the horizontal dashed line. And only if you assume an activity factor of 5%, you don't need any six gigahertz spectrum in Lagos. But if you think about it, especially in places like Lagos, where you haven't got such a good fixed network infrastructure, more work will have to be done by uh, the mobile networks. And so activity factors will be higher. And I would have thought that uh, Nigeria would be best off by uh, joining uh, or assigning the entire 1.2 gigahertz uh, to mobile as licensed for mobile spectrum. And here, the, the other uh, country or cities, we can't look at them all in detail, uh, but again, you can download the presentation and it's all there. Now, we talked about the role of six gigahertz inside the cities, and as you saw, it is required to deliver the 5G vision of 100 megabits uh, anytime, anywhere. Um, Outside the cities, the role of six gigahertz spectrum is really to provide 5G fixed wireless access. Um, the, as a result of the performance improvement of LTEA and now 5G, uh, fixed wireless access is experiencing rapid growth worldwide. We have uh, already lots of operators and now there are even lots of people who operate 5G FWA. Uh, in, in uh, quite a few countries. So 30 oper 38 operators sell 5G-based FWA already, and this is only within a few months after 5G uh, becoming uh, a commercial rea reality. And when you look at the growth of broadband subscribers by technology in 2019, these, these are statistics from Point Topic, you can see that uh, FWA or wireless is really the fastest growing technology, and rightly so, because it's the cheapest way of bringing broadband to uh, people and businesses. So uh, with 5G FWA, fixed wireless growth is likely to accelerate further to become the dominant form of fixed broadband connectivity in developing countries. Uh, this is because simply developing countries in particular, uh, they haven't got the fixed broadband infrastructure you find in developed countries. So uh, if you think about it, only a small percentage are connected by broadband in with all the couple networks and very few with fibers. So it absolutely makes sense to use uh, FWA to bring uh, the uh, bandwidth to homes and businesses. Again, because it's much cheaper and with 5G, the technical capabilities have improved enormously and more spectrum can be made available. So some countries such as South Korea and UAE and so, so on, they have near universal uh, fiber access, but uh, in many developed countries, there's still lack of rural broadband connectivity so therefore, even in developed countries, using FWA to bridge the uh, rural divide, the urban rural divide is important. And of course, without a doubt, in uh, developing countries, it is absolutely major. And this is also borne out by some uh, forecasts from Ericsson in that contrast. So what we are seeing is in, in uh, a developed market, we're really seeing the end of copper 
copper, especially when the distance to exchanges are high, is no good to provide uh, high bandwidth to premises. And building fiber uh, to rural premises is simply takes too much time and it's too expensive. So uh, in uh, developed markets, uh, policymakers will not be able to reach their uh, rural connectivity goals without FWA. Uh, rural fiber, where you put it, requires subsidy, but 5G FWA in rural areas is in the order of 50 to 80 percent lower uh, in cost compared to fiber. So, therefore, it is an important message to policymakers in developed markets that they could save a shed load of money on subsidies if. Uh, they assign uh, the six gigahertz spectrum for IMT or, and it can then be used, deployed by the mobile operators uh, to provide FWA. Um, we modeled that, so we looked at the required data rate for per FWA connection, again, the concurrent use, which would be higher for FWA, uh, and the supported number for cell towers. Why is that? Because the FWA business case is highly dependent on the number of connections that can be supported per cell tower. The more spectrum you can deploy on a cell tower, the better the business case uh, becomes. And that is driving uh, the, the uh, commercial viability of FWA uh, in rural. And so the more spectrum you have, the lower the need for subsidies, or you can avoid subsidies altogether. So the number of premises supported by WA site depend on the spec, on the amount of spectrum per site. And you can see here, if I only have the uh, 600 megahertz of 3.5 or 4.5 spectrum, I can support 220 homes or premises uh, at 100 megabits. If I have uh, an additional 700 megahertz uh, of six gigahertz spectrum, I can support 381 homes. And then if I have uh, 1,200 megahertz uh, in the six gigahertz band, I, the entire band, I can in fact support 496 homes. Of course, broadband is not standing still and the demand for speed is increasing. So 100 megabits is not where it ends. This is really where it starts. Uh, and the more spectrum you have, the more future proof uh, the FWA uh, solution is to meet the needs uh, beyond 2030. So in developing countries, all of this is true, but on top of it, uh, we must really consider that internet access in developing countries is synonymous, synonymous with wireless access. There is more or less uh, no fixed network in most places in the developing markets. So uh, the six gigahertz spectrum must is, is really almost, you could say it's a, it's a bit like a fiber replacement. Uh, so there are around two to 2.4 billion households uh, in the world and the global broadband connection, excluding mobile stood at about 1.1 to 1.2 billion, which uh, means that 0.9 to 1.2 while one have a broadband connection in the form of DSL fiber cable or FWA, but over 1 billion do not. And these 1 billion, most of these are in the developing countries where affordability is a key issue. And so using the 6 gigahertz spectrum in addition to other midbands for 5G FWA will make broadband more affordable in developing countries. Uh, in this context, I think it's worth looking at the uh, Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development 2020 targets, they make it quite explicit. By 2025, entry-level broadband services should be made affordable in developing countries at less than 2% of monthly gross national income per capita. So uh, the ability then to deploy a lot of spectrum per site uh, will really reduce the cost per bit. And that is why identifying the entire six gigahertz band for IMT would make a significant contribution to deliver affordable broadband in emerging markets. 
Uh, just a quick word on the use of uh, Wi-Fi versus mobile in the six gigahertz band. Um, because as you know, in the US, the entire band has been uh, given to unlicensed use, which makes sense because the US has a uh, very, very developed uh, fiber network. And, and so the use of Wi-Fi is, is great. And of course, Wi-Fi is a great technology. It is an important connectivity tool but Wi-Fi only provides the last hop uh, between devices and the broadband access network. So as we noted, in developing countries, you haven't got the broadband uh, access network to begin with, the fiber. So the usefulness of Wi-Fi is not really there. So in other words, uh, assigning the entire six gigahertz band for unlicensed, i.e. Wi-Fi use, is a sort of rich worlds uh, thing, but it doesn't really help to serve, uh, solve the connectivity uh, problem in emerging markets, because there you really have to focus on bringing broadband uh, to people and uh, the six gigahertz spectrum should be used to overcome the connectivity bottleneck, I have an IMT identification. So, uh, the other point when we look at Wi-Fi use versus uh, 5G, the thing is, this, this is data from OpenSignal and they uh, spoke earlier in this conference, is where 5G has been launched, we are now seeing that actually uh, uh, five, in most cases, 5G is faster than Wi-Fi. So why bother with Wi-Fi when 5G uh, delivers all you need, particularly is, as I mentioned earlier, since most uh, 5G packages are unlimited. So why go via a sort of secondary access network uh, called Wi-Fi? Uh, of course, people always say uh, that, well, you know, what about Wi-Fi offload? But Wi-Fi offloading is declining. Wi-Fi offload is when people are at home, then they tend to use Wi-Fi rather than the mobile network. Of course, they, they do that because Wi-Fi tends to be uh, free, it's there, and after all, 5G isn't there in most cases, so it makes absolute sense to do that. But in fact, Wi-Fi onload is growing. The fastest uh, growth is Wi-Fi onload. We are seeing a surge in the sale of uh, routers where people put one of these routers or packs uh, in their home and distribute the Wi-Fi signal uh, around their home but the connect, connection to the network is in fact over 4G or 5G. So for the consumers, the advantage of using the six gigahertz for IMT is really that spectrum isn't the bottleneck of the user experience now and in future. Uh, and of course, Wi-Fi uh, 6 only meets the high-speed demand from for FTTH users. If, if you haven't got fiber, then frankly, uh, faster Wi-Fi is not much good to you. Uh, so that is key for consumers and for businesses really, or for enterprise. The uh, difference is really this, this is difference between Wi-Fi and uh, IMT. Wi-Fi cannot guarantee high levels of reliability, which is an essential feature of 5G new radio. Uh, Wi-Fi can only meet the capacity needs for few users, not wide area deployment. Then there's the issue of latency, which can be guaranteed in 5G, but not Wi-Fi. And last, but perhaps most importantly, there is, uh, of course, mobility. And mobility is, of course, a feature of mobile networks by definition, so 5G mobile. But even Wi-Fi uh, 6 has latency, handover, and, of course, coverage issues, and cannot compare in that sense with mobile. Uh, Quick word about sharing with incumbents. That's, of course, always important. Uh, work on coexistence is underway, and the initial results are encouraging. So that's all I have time to say on this topic. But just to summarize the key findings, uh, what are the benefits of using 6 gigahertz spectrum for IMT? And uh, I think they're slightly different in developed countries versus developing countries. Some are common. Firstly, of course, to economically deliver a consistent 100 uh, megabits user experience data rate citywide in urban and suburban. That's relevant 
in both developing countries and developed countries, ensures that FWA is a long-term solution, again, in both environments. And then particularly in developing countries, lower cost, cost urban FWA to overcome the lack of fiber and uh, DSL broadband access. In both developed and developing countries, uh, the economics of FWA broadband is uh, very much improved, which helps to bridge the digital divide between urban and rural. And relevant for developing countries is that assigning six gigahertz spectrum for IMT, it helps to deliver the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and uh, I would also briefly point to the fact that, of course, in time, we will have things such as self-driving class. It, it seems fanciful now. We will have uh, smart transport systems. And so the six gigahertz spec spectrum has also a role to, to play to deliver the 100 megabits user experience data rate along busy highways, i.e. outside major population centers. And lastly, again, it contributes to reaching the ITU and UNESCO Broadband Commission 2025 targets. So uh, as I said, we, we had to dash through it. We only had a few minutes uh, for this presentation. Uh, if you'd like to receive the report, please email me. I am now uh, will go out of this presentation, stop sharing my screen, and we can take some questions. Let me see what questions I have. All right. Uh, we have one question here from uh, James Curtin. Uh, do you think the six gigahertz spectrum will be important uh, future 5G band across uh, all Asia and in what time frame? And the answer is yes, I think it will because policy policymakers will recognize that they the benefit the spectrum brings. Uh, and I think they'll uh, take steps to make this available. There are of course coexistence issues. Uh, it has to be, uh, this has to be addressed. And so following WRC 23, perhaps uh, in the latter half of that 10-year time frame, uh, we are likely to see this happening. Are there any other questions? Um, just wonder, is anybody else who has a burning question? If not, just, oh, we have another question. Uh, right. Well, okay. Uh, here's the issue uh, that is being asked here by Danny Setiawan from uh, Indonesia. Uh, hello, Danny. Um, well, the, the, the problem really, it's, it's what I outlined. Um, if you assign the spectrum for Wi-Fi, then uh, it, or if it's unlicensed and people deploy low power devices in their, in their homes and uh, businesses, and it is, the spectrum is not available to overcome the excess bottleneck. So in other words, people first have to get fiber to their premises, and then they have to put up these Wi-Fi 6 routers. Uh, whereas, of course, what it would be a much cheaper option for mobile operators to run fiber to their cell towers, and then on the cell towers, you deploy the 6 gigahertz spectrum, and that provides the access to people uh, to some of them might be uh, or smartphones and also in an FWA solutions to uh, routers that, or CPE that might be indoor or outdoor CPE. So it is a much better solution. And particularly for Indonesia, of course, where mobile operator have so little spectrum. So how can they possibly be deliver the 100 megabits user experience data rate if they do not have access to the six gigahertz spectrum? And uh, by the way, we could do that modeling for Jakarta. Uh, please contact me and uh, we can uh, do that demand uh, modeling 
for Port Jakarta, like the examples you have seen for Tokyo, Lagos, uh, and Sao Paulo. Any other questions? Maybe James, you picked up another question. So I would stress this. Uh, okay, well, there are no more questions. Well, as I just said to conclude, uh, there are many benefits. We're looking a long time ahead uh, to the point in 10 years time when 5G is mature. And in this context, I think it's well worth for uh, NRAs and the relevant regional uh, groupings such uh, uh, as APT to support uh, an IMT identification for the six gigahertz band at WRC 23. With that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I hope I hear from you. Bye-bye.